Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. It's a joy and an honor to share God's word with you today. I wish I could be with you in person. The longing to be together in worship in person is something many of us feel so strongly these days, probably more strongly than we ever imagined we would. The Psalms speak of longing to be in the courts of the Lord's house. That's something that's taken on a whole new meaning for us these days in the pandemic. We long and pray for the time when we can be fully back together in person in worship and study and service. Until that time, we're called to act compassionately and responsibly and to be open to the Holy Spirit leading us into new ways to worship and to serve. The second chapter of 1 John continues with some of the themes David highlighted last week. I want to focus today on one passage in this chapter, verses 15 to 17. Let me read those verses again. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride and riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. So what are we to make of this call? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Lauren Isley was a wonderful writer, a scientist with the heart of a poet. In his masterful essay, The Star Thrower, Isley quotes this passage. He writes, it was as though I, as man, was being asked to confront in all its overbearing weight the universe itself. Love not the world, the biblical injunction runs, neither the things of the world. But I do love the world, I whispered. I love its small ones, the things beaten in the strangling surf, the birds singing which flies and falls and is not seen again. I choked and said I love the lost ones, the failures of the world. Is that what this passage is about? Is it calling us not to love birds and sea life, other creatures, trees and flowers? How about dogs and cats? No, there are certainly Christians who believe that being spiritual means having as little to do with this physical world and the ordinary day-to-day -day life in it as possible. This passage is one that they use to support that idea. But what if this passage is trying to teach us something very different? One of the main principles of the Reformation is that we should let Scripture interpret Scripture. We need to look at the whole message of the Bible as we read and study different parts of the Bible. We need not to take passages out of their context. The Bible clearly, emphatically teaches that this physical, material world was created by God, and God loves it deeply. That is precisely what the best known passage of the Bible declares. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life indeed. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It's the world, not just its human inhabitants, but the world that God loves so deeply and that Jesus came to save. If God loves the world, shouldn't we love it also? Besides that, we have another very strong reason to recognize that this scripture passage is not referring to the physical world when it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Because this passage goes on to explain just what it means by the things of the world. It doesn't speak of animals, trees, flowers, or any part of the physical world. Rather, it speaks of something drastically different. It speaks of what we might describe as worldly, sinful ways of living. It says, for all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the, the pride in riches 
comes not from the Father, but from the world. What John describes here as things of the world are not animals or trees or flowers, nothing material at all. What John calls us to turn from are our desires and urges that grow out of human sin, out of greed, out of pride and covetousness. God wants us to love God's creation. God calls us to love and rejoice and to care for, to protect and nurture this world which God loves so dearly. God wants us to learn from Jesus how to treat this world and the people in it rather than following the sinful ways that people have developed. There's one more Bible passage which helps us recognize how strongly God cares about this physical world and, and our ordinary day-to-day -day life in it, and it does it in a way that, that I love. I think it's marvelous. It comes from John's Gospel. David read for us last week. John begins his Gospel declaring, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A few verses later, John tells us, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John starts off his gospel telling us, his readers, that Jesus is indeed truly God in the flesh. Throughout the gospel, we, the readers, are waiting for Jesus' followers to recognize this central truth about him. That moment finally comes a week after Easter when the risen Jesus stands before Thomas and invites him to touch the marks of the nails, the spear, to encounter fully the reality of both Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. Thomas falls to his knees at Jesus' feet and exclaims, my Lord and my God. This is the climax of John's gospel. And John seems ready to wrap things up here. He says that there is, of course, so much more he could write about Jesus, but that he has written these things so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. But then it's as if John says to himself, no, I can't stop here. I have to tell him just one more thing, one more time. It's too good to leave out. Let's set the stage. Now that Jesus has finally been recognized for who he is, God, the creator, the Lord of the universe. What is the setting you would next expect to see Jesus in? On a golden throne in a majestic heavenly throne room? Returning on clouds with legions of angels? In the temple of Jerusalem as the focus of the most epic worship service ever. What John shares with us is surprisingly different from any of those scenarios. Would you have guessed that Jesus would next be glimpsed on the lake shore at dawn, cooking up fish as breakfast for his friends? I mean, who could possibly imagine such a thing? Well, Jesus not only imagined it, he did it. So the next time you wonder if the ordinary day-to-day -day parts of life really matter much to God, just remember Jesus, the creator and Lord of the universe, there on the lake shore at dawn, cooking a breakfast of fried fish for his friends. So we spend a little time exploring what this passage is not trying to teach us. Let's spend some time looking at what it does want to teach us. To help with that, I want to share with you the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this passage in the message. This is what he writes. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically, everything that goes on in the world, wanting our own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. 
In this passage, we hear echoes of Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed, the, the seed that fell among the thorns especially. Jesus describes it, and others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. The lure of wealth, the desire for other things, what Eugene Peterson describes as all the wanting, wanting, wanting chokes out God's word in our lives and chokes out our love for the Father. In a few minutes, you're going to hear and be, then be invited to join in singing one of my favorite recent hymns, Shepherd Me, O God. It might be new to you, but I hope it's going to become one of your favorites as it's one of mine. It's a paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm by Marty Haugen. I often sing it in my head, especially when I'm anxious. The refrain goes, shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. At first, it was the thought of God shepherding me beyond my fears that made me like this song so much. We all have fears. And fear has a terrible ability to dominate our lives, to choke out everything else. I don't know anyone who would choose to have their life dominated by fear, but there are times when most of us experience having our life dominated by fear, at least for a while. But as I sang this song and listened to it more, I, I started also pay attention to the part about God shepherding me beyond my wants. I came to realize I really don't want my life to be dominated by my wants and desires any more than I want to be dominated by my fears. To have your life dominated either by wants or by fears, either way is a path that leads to death. Not a pathway that opens us up to life. But there's another choice open to us. Open to us because Jesus came to us, came to shepherd us beyond our wants, beyond our fears. Nothing else in this world can compare to Jesus or to what Jesus offers us, the life Jesus offers us. Think about it. Jesus is truly the creator and Lord of this marvelous universe. But Jesus is also the one who loves us so much that he died an excruciating death on the cross for us, even as we were rejecting him. And even though we had rejected him, even though we had sent him to the cross, when he rose to the grave, he came back to call us to himself, inviting us to share fully in his divine life and his love. Nothing else can possibly compare with this life that Jesus longs to share with us. It is a life truly where Jesus shepherds us beyond our wants, beyond our fears, so that we can be set free to live in the freedom of the children of God. Nothing else compares to that. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. May that prayer echo in our hearts and become the refrain of our lives. Amen.